Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for uh, being here with us uh, today. Uh, this afternoon, we, we have uh, another session of the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series. Uh, this is a set of uh, lectures and um, seminars that we from the um, Humanities uh, at the University of the West Indies, uh, Mona Campus, we are sorry for the interruption. I'm having some back sound. Uh, yes, as I was telling you, this is uh, uh, one more session. Sorry, Robinson, sorry. Um, are you okay? Yes. Yeah, so You're good. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are in a one more of the um, series of the session of the uh, Humanities in Action virtual seminar series, uh, in which we share uh, information and uh, what's uh, been the move on during this uh, pandemic and this uh, COVID-19 situation. Uh, we want to share with you uh, in this occasion, what have been the, 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 the different moves that our students around the globe are taking. So we'll be sharing with you information and a live interview with five of our students who are currently doing a, a moving around the world. I would like to show you a little sip of what they do, how they have been facing the unexpected, how uh, they and the places they are located at are coping with the COVID-19 uh, while studying and teaching abroad. So we are very pleased to have this uh, interesting set of uh, invitees today. Uh, with me uh, is uh, Swayini, uh, who's also a French instructor uh, from the Department uh, of Modern Languages and Literatures. Before I, we start, I would like to share with you the um, screen uh, with a, a, a general view of uh, the places in which our, our students are currently are located. So we have persons, as you can see there in the chart, that are located uh, on the um, on the, 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 the farthest side of the world in Asia. So we will have a person that comes from Japan who's currently advancing his English teaching program there. We will get more information on that soon. We also have persons in Europe. We currently have two persons, one from Spain, one located in Spain and the one located in France. Uh, who just uh, recently returned. And we have uh, two of our participants that are located in the West Indies. So I am very much pleased to uh, um, introduce this seminar, this series, on behalf of myself and on behalf of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Uh, I will leave you with Suyini, who will uh, lead us to our participants. Thank you uh, once more uh, to you all for being here with us uh, today. I hope this is a, a very informative, insightful, and pleasant uh, afternoon to everyone. Thank you to all the persons in the audience. We'll be, taking, we'll be able to take your questions, so I hope it's a very nurturing session for you, and you have many questions to ask. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it with Soini. Soini, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Robinson. That was Robinson Alvarado, one of our Spanish instructors. Uh, my name is Soini Ashby. I'm a French instructor in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. Um, I just want to present to you our participants today. We have five of them from all over the world. As you saw in the map, 
We have as far away as Japan and as near as Martinique. We have Renique Thomas, who is on the JET program, the Jamaica Exchange, sorry, not the Jamaica, the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, JET, where the Japanese government, with the, in collaboration with the Japanese embassy, recruits college graduates to teach English in Japanese schools. So Renique will explain to us a little bit more about how that works and where he, what his experiences are like. Uh, then we have Ariel Blackwood and Russell Green, who are, have been taking part in the teaching assistantship program in France. It's similar to the JET program where the French government recruits English speaking students and graduates to teach to assist in the teaching of French, to teach, assist with the teaching of English in French schools. And that is also in collaboration with the Embassy of France. Uh, we have Rolando Caballero, who, although the name sounds Spanish, he's Belizean, and he, is come, he has left Mona for the University of Valladolid in Spain as part of the Erasmus Plus or the Erasmus Mundus program, which is funded by the European Union. And finally, we have Gabriel Boudou, who is a student of the University of the West Indies, participating in the MPIC program, MPIC, which is a program, a five-year program, where students gain a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in politics and international cooperation. They study at three different universities, the University of the West Indies, University de, Université des Antilles in Martinique, and Sciences Po in Bordeaux. So those are five, four programs, study abroad programs that students of French, Japanese, and Spanish can aspire to participate in. And we hope that this session will stimulate your interest in those programs. So without further ado, let's go to our first speaker. Uh, we're gonna start from the farthest geographical region. We're gonna start with Japan. So we're gonna start with Renique Thomas. Renique, you are on the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got involved in the program? Hey, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. I am Renique, uh, as you said, and uh, I was a student of social sciences. I majored in international relations and uh, I had to take language courses in the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures, of which I opted to take uh, Japanese and Spanish courses. Uh, I also participated in exchange, so I did a year abroad in Canada. And while there I met many Japanese students and my love for Japanese only grew while I was in Canada. So after completing my degree at UE, I decided to apply for the JET program, which is a Japan exchange and teaching program, as you said. And my job here is to assist in English language education while also helping the internationalization of Japan as the number of foreigners in Japan is extremely low. Uh, so my daily activities also includes bringing a foreign experience into the Japanese classrooms. So that's what I've been doing since uh, graduating UE two years ago. Okay. Thank you, Renik. Uh, can you tell us what life was like for you in Japan as a teacher before the COVID-19 pandemic began? Okay, so before the pandemic, as I just mentioned, a few of my responsibilities uh, during uh, normal work time, uh, I teach at three primary schools and one junior high school, which is from grades seven to nine. And on a daily basis, I would ride my bicycle, whether it's rain or sun, to school. And um, I have a certain number of classes per day. And in the city that I live, I would uh, sometimes visit different high schools or elementary schools. As I mentioned, uh, internationalization is a huge part of the JET program. And so the city tries its best to get students uh, acquainted with foreigners. Uh, for many of the students or older people here, they haven't interacted with black people like myself. And so a huge part of my daily work, you know, is showing kids that different colored people exist 
and you know responding to different questions you know why are you black did you get sunburned uh a part of my regular lifestyle is just showing students and all the people in the city that i live that uh black is just another part of the human race and um yeah before the pandemic uh it was quite uh, an interesting experience that was happening for the two years that I've been in Nagasaki in Japan. Okay. Have you been able to make many friends and contacts in Japan? Mm. <laughs> well, um, the social culture is extremely different in Japan and Jamaica. And um, I would I would dare to say that contact between people is way less here than what you would see back home uh, so being the open person that i am i i would try to make as many friendships as possible but uh being in the countryside is one barrier secondly there's a language barrier and thirdly there's a fact that many young people my age move away from my city to live in the bigger cities and so uh, making friendships has definitely been uh, a problem <laughs> uh, for me uh, here in, in Japan. Okay, I understand. Yes. So when COVID-19 hit, what measures did the government put in place and how did your life change? Well, I think Japan was one of the first countries to declare a lockdown. Uh, so constitutionally the japanese government doesn't have the uh, right to declare a full lockdown as was seen in other countries but i think from march 4th or 5th the japanese government closed all schools uh there was a declaration that schools would be closed for two weeks and so immediately students stopped uh, coming to school from early march and uh, due to the work culture in japan if students aren't at school that doesn't mean that teachers will not be at school so the lockdown was for students and students were allowed to stay home but teachers were still required to be at school uh, even though there was uh, the danger of getting ill during this pandemic and so for that very first uh, lockdown i was still going to school uh, there was nothing to do and um of, as far as we're we tend to be more vocal in Japan. And so the foreigners, you know, were complaining, why is it that we have to go to school? The students aren't here, we should stay home. Uh, but due to our contract, uh, we were required to go to school. So nothing much changed for me during the first lockdown, except that the students weren't at school. And um, I, I actually traveled during the pandemic. So I, I visited Jamaica in March. And upon coming back to Japan, I was quarantined. And after the quarantine requirements were put in place by the government, they also issued a no travel uh, request. So you, you, you weren't uh, advised to travel across state or uh, border lines within the country. So yeah, some of the policies that they implemented, they closed school, they had quarantine requirements, of course, and they also requested that people stay home during the uh, time. What about um, ma wearing masks and social distancing and that kind of thing? Was that also practiced? Okay, so um, Japanese culture is, built on social distancing <laughs> i dare to say um if you as a foreigner come to japan you would realize that people tend to be to keep their distance from each other uh, so even on the trains you would get in as a foreigner you'd sit down and you'd see many open spaces to sit but someone would come into the train and decide to stand as far away as possible from everyone else and this is this is just a normal occurrence and also with the wearing of masks uh, from a long time ago, Japanese people have worn masks. So during times of illness or the flu season, you would see many people wearing their masks. Or um, just on interviews on TV, people would say they wear their masks in order to like uh, decrease social interactions. So when the government required that masks be worn in Japan, there was nothing new taking place because it was uh, very normal to see people wearing masks here. Okay. Mm. 
before we move on to a, our next participants, I would like to 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 to, to take um, uh, a little bit of a more contextual question, in the sense that, sure. if, for example, we have a, that in Japan. Uh, there have been floodings uh, these days. There has been a, 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 there's been a, historically a, 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 a kind of preparedness from the government, from the citizenship. Uh, but all, but at the same time, you have a, a, a country that is a well populated. No, uh, the, the, the population yeah. in Japan is. If you compare, for example, with the ones in Latin America or in Jamaica, it's a, it's big. So yeah. uh, there, there uh, has uh, there been any challenges or changes that you perceive in that uh, as a contextual note that you would like to share with us? Um, so as I just mentioned, uh, I am actually affected by the flooding. So this week school has been closed due to flooding uh, in my city. But uh, as I mentioned, during times of uh, crisis, Japanese teachers aren't exempt from work uh, due to the work culture in Japan. So teachers are actually required to still be at work this week, though the students have been told to uh, stay home. So similar to the pandemic, uh, cities or municipalities are given the right to decide what happens. And so it was cities like mine during the pandemic that would decide if or not students should come to school. Uh, so within the... Uh, flooding uh, the same context uh, the city has decided students would stay home uh, but teachers are still required to be at work okay thank you Renique uh, yeah. can you tell us what was the most challenging aspect of your experience and how did you cope okay I think the most challenging aspect was the stay at home period um, because unlike other countries where online classes were taking place, there was nothing taking place where I am in Japan. Uh, so we, as, as I said, as the foreigners, we were more vocal to uh, not attending school due to the pandemic uh, taking place. And so our city finally granted us a stay-at-home uh, order where we were required to work from home, make documents, make activities, uh, for students, but since there were no classes taking place for the entire five weeks, I believe we were home, uh, there was nothing happening. Uh, we were told not to go outside, only leave for the essentials. And um, as someone who is very social, I believe this uh, was devastating to uh, my mental health. Um, it, it was really difficult being alone at home the entire time. And I dare to say that uh, being here in Japan, you already have to deal with uh, isolation a lot. And so this was uh, not very different, but now you just weren't allowed to leave your home or your apartment. And so things that were done to cope, I, I bought myself a football uh, from a sports hmm. store. And you know my friend that lives not far from me, uh, we would, you know, kick a football in the part that's like 10 minutes from my home. Or, uh, you know, I would do stuff that I, I would normally do, watch movies, uh, study a bit of Japanese or French or something uh, in order to try to keep sane because it was a really difficult period. Okay. Thank you, Renik. Yes. Thank you. No I'd just like to remind our audience that you can ask questions in the chat section of YouTube and we will try and, res try and have our participants respond as, as we go along. So now we move on to Ariel Blackwood, who was a teaching assistant in France, specifically in Bordeaux. Hello, Ariel. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into the program of the teaching assistantship? Okay, hi, so you hi everybody. Um, so my name is Ariel Blackwood. Um, I joined the teaching assistant program in France um, a year or so after I graduated from university. So after I graduated from university, I had done um, a scholarship program in China and I was encouraged by my lecturers afterwards. They said to me, okay, since you've gone to China and you, you know, um, 
studied chi the Chinese language, since I did um, my studies in French and Mandarin Chinese, they said, okay, since you've done, you know, studies in Chinese, why don't you know, you do something related to your major? Because my major was in, in, in French. So they said to me, all right, try the, the assistant teaching program, see how it goes. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll do that. So I applied for the assistant teaching program that would be last year. And so I went to France in, at the end of September last year. So actually, so I was there up until last week, actually, in France. So I was able to return home last week. Um, um, because I was able to get onto like a charter flight to get back home. So, yeah. What was like life like in France for you on a daily basis before COVID-19? What was your routine like teaching? Okay. So I was assigned to a, a primary school. So I would teach students between the ages of six and 11. And so luckily I was um, where I was staying. I was staying with one of the, the teachers. So I was, basically like a 10 minute walk away from the school. So most days I would be at school from like around um, 8.30 to 4.30. And then I would have like my evenings off to like chill with um, my friends or just to stay home and prepare like further um, activities for the, the upcoming, for the following day for the students. So the, how the system was, so for my school, um, we would get Wednesdays off. Like in general for the primary school, there wouldn't be any school on Wednesdays, but they also allowed us to have like an extra day. So I got like, um, I got Fridays off as well. So, um, so I would go to school on Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays and um, Wednesdays and Fridays and the weekend, it would be a combination of preparation for the upcoming classes as well as to, to um, go out and sightsee and try and experience the French, <laughs> the French cities. So, yeah. So what kinds of things did you do with your downtime? Um, so I tried out as many restaurants as I could because food is an important thing for me. So I had wanted to um, basically like introduce myself to different types of cuisine. I don't think I, I don't think I succeeded in that aspect because, um, so I did get to visit some places where I got to try the French, um, French cuisine, but a lot of the times I was like going to like fast food restaurants, which, um, I didn't get to experience as much, but I also realized that in terms of food, they, they consume a lot of dairy and a lot of chocolate. Cause I've noticed that, um, with say for breakfast, if you look at the options that they have for cereal, it's a lot of chocolate-based cereal. And the, um, the dishes that they normally provide has a lot of dairy. And so for me, I, I'm lactose intolerant. And so that was an issue for me when I was there. And so I thought, okay, it's France, it's Europe. You know, I will be able to get um, like lactase tablets, tablets that I could take before eating something with dairy so I wouldn't have any repercussions after eating something with dairy. So the first few weeks, um, I was basically traveling around the city to find places where I could like purchase these lactase tablets. But apparently this, not, this isn't a thing in France. So I found out through um, my doctor there that um, they don't sell lactase tablets. So if you are lactose intolerant then and you want to go to France, um, either you choose options where there's no dairy or you purchase lactase tablets before you arrive in France because apparently being intolerant to lactose is not a thing in France. So tell us, Ariel, um, what measures did the government put in place to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic? So... Um, what they did was um, around March 18th, they had said that from after the 18th of March, um, schools will be locked down, um, business will be closed as well. And so initially people thought it was a holiday and so they'd go out and go to the park and get some sun. And then afterwards, because of that, 
um, the government had to man- like give a new mandate where you can only go for an hour. You have to have a document and attestation actually, which stipulates what you can do in that hour. So you have to tick whichever option is provided, which one best suits you. So if it is that you need to go grocery shopping, you would take that option. If you needed to um, do your daily exercise, you take that option. If you were an essential worker, you take that option. Or if it is that you need to drop off like necessities for someone who was um, in need, who couldn't go outside, like for example, the elderly, then, um, then you take that option. And then also you had to give the date and time as to when you'd be leaving out. So that, um, because they had um, police on, on the streets who would do like spot checks. So they would basically check to see if it is that you're following the rules and regulations. And if it is that you didn't follow the rules and regulations, then you would be fined a hefty sum of money. So you had to have that document as well as also you had to be wearing masks everywhere you went in order to avoid um, exposure to, to COVID. And also, if it is that you were um, going into the supermarkets to do your usual grocery shopping, they would have um, like bottles of hand sanitizer at the front of the store. So you had to go in and you had to sanitize before you went in fully to do your shopping. And if it is that you didn't have your mask on at all, then you wouldn't be able to enter the stores. So, so basically, you couldn't... You also couldn't go anywhere beyond the one kilometers of your um, residence. So you could only go to stores or pharmacies that were in that one kilometer radius. Anywhere beyond that, um, you would be in trouble, and they would find you. They would find you money for that, as well. Mm. So there is one thing that i i i now would like to ask you uh, thank you for being here with us um mm-hmm. now that you've been through the experience of actually going through the airport and travel you do, doing this a uh, uh, interoceanic uh, travel uh, what was it like i mean was it difficult is there uh, what things you see uh, from airport to airport you know the end to end uh, what things, what changes have you perceived? Have you been able to to, to, to see and feel? And uh, what would what would be your assessment on that? So, because of the pandemic, there was um, the, the, there was a decrease in flights. So, my contract basically stipulated that I was supposed to return home at the end of April, um, but because um, flights were cancelled, I couldn't come back until. June or at the end of June really and um, so basically between then and my coming home it was always a a case of like do I have the disease Um, what am I going to do so basically it was there was always like a little bit of panic in the in the in the in the back of my head when whenever I was doing anything so like when I was at the airport when coming home I noticed that um like especially when coming from the airport in Bordeaux, there. So what they did was they didn't um, have the AC on or anything because there wasn't any filter system to like filter out any um, um, what you call it viruses or anything in the air or any any particles in the air. So when we went in the airport, it was extremely hot. Um, we there weren't any places that you could get any um, like souvenirs or anything the only place was like um like a mini mart and say a starbucks where you could quickly get something to eat and um so basically basically you had to be um they they had um stipulations where like you had to like sit like a seat away from each other you had to always have your mask on at all times um you had to have like hand sanitizer near you anytime if you had to touch a surface you had to like disinfect your hands right after um, so it was basically just trying to be on the safe side the entire time for my trip back home. And also it was the same thing when I was there in Bordeaux in that, when in the transportation system, you have to wear your mask at all times. They also had the, the, the social distancing where you couldn't sit beside one another unless you were a part of the same household. Um, if it is that you weren't on, if you didn't have your, your mask on, on say the bus or the tram, um, the bus driver would 
basically kick you out because you didn't have your mask on. If you're on the tram, there will be officers who would at different checkpoints at different tram stops, they would check to see who was wearing their mask and who wasn't wearing their mask. If you weren't wearing your mask, you were removed from the tram, possibly fined. So it was basically a time of like just trying to be careful and whatnot. So basically you're kind of a bit like on, on edge because you don't know at the time you didn't know like what was what was going to happen to you after so you're basically just trying to keep careful or be careful like be cautious essentially okay thank you ariel you're welcome um how did you look after your mental health during this period Mm, okay so initially when the lockdown was initiated i pretty much locked myself in my room because i wasn't sure at the time if i had contracted the virus or not so i was trying to be extra careful and so i lived with um as i said i lived with one of the teachers from the school and she had a family so i tried to um reduce as much interactions between or amongst us so I'd only go out to like um, do the laundry or like make food and so because I was cooped up in my room it kind of took a toll on me because I didn't realize that I thrived on interaction with people so um, so for a while I was basically stuck and I would just um, just watch movies read books but then I realized that didn't help so my means of coping was actually um, doing groceries on a weekly basis where I was able to um, meet my friend who lived near, near me. And so basically that would be my interaction with the outside where, where we would talk about whatever stuff we'd seen on the internet or how we'd be managing with the, the entire lockdown, um, what's for dinner, that thing. So that was my means of coping initially um yeah okay thank you ariel you're welcome um we're gonna move a bit south to spain uh rolando caballero was f participating in the erasmus mundos program in valladolid spain <coughs> excuse me Rolando, could you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got involved in the program? Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Rolando Caballero here, international relations major and a minor in Spanish. Um, I'm currently still in Valladolid, actually my last day. I'm, I was attending the Universidad de Valladolid in, in the city of Valladolid. Um, prior to COVID, um, I was actually very eager to to know, you know, much about Spanish culture and everything, society and everything, and my my space. So it was very smooth. Everything was going really like I anticipated. You know, meeting people, and on the Erasmus program, there are so many um, students from across Europe and from across the world because we even had some students from from across our region, the Caribbean region. So it was very interesting to you know to be in a space to mingle among, you know, other very young and, you know, eager students. Did you manage to meet many Spanish students? I actually, the, the only Spanish people or students that I met was um, in my classes, you know, like if, if they're not Erasmus, perhaps like majority Italians or from Eastern Europe, or you know, up France, there would be there would be Spaniards, and so um, I interacted a lot with them. All my lectures that I had were Spanish as well. What was your course load like? My course load was five courses, six courses actually, five that I had to sign up for, and an additional Spanish course that wasn't really mandatory, but you know, they recommend that you do it. So I was doing. Six courses, basically. Okay. And we know that um, Spain was hit hard by the pandemic. 
what was it like for you? Actually, um, I, I always say that, you know, perhaps the Spanish government took a really long time to, 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 to act upon what was going on. So I actually had to, you know, take my own precaution and I stopped going to school a couple of days before the lockdown. Nobody knew that there was going to be a lockdown. So I, you know, being the Caribbean person that I am, you know, founded upon survival and listening to your instincts, I, I decided to stop going to school a couple of days before the state of emergency came about. And so um, I stayed inside and actually my coping mechanism was that I had another Italian student here living in the same apartment with me and the Erasmus program as well. So it wasn't as bad as I thought it would have been, but um, I think it was pretty scary for a lot of Spanish people, including, you know, everyone that was here but because spanish culture is very jovial and everyone is hugging around and kissing and stuff like that it was very interesting and very weird to see the streets pretty much empty and i can recall prior to covid you would hear um students singing on the streets or people just randomly walking around and making a lot of noise at two o'clock in the morning and so we had to adapt to not hearing or seeing anyone on the street and so um, besides that, I think I kind of juggle it, a, you know, a little well with some challenges, of course. What was the most challenging experience and how did you cope with it? I think the most challenging experience for me, like I knew COVID was out there, but I think I had that 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 peace of mind that I had stopped interacting with the outside the world days prior to, to, you know, the lockdown. So um, one of the most challenging parts for me was actually the change in routine. So my sleep schedule got totally messed up. Um, I was struggling to kind of keep up with academics and stuff, the online stuff. It was all new, so I had to adapt to, to you know, to just everything that was going on. I wasn't really that scared of what was going on outside because I literally was not going outside unless it was to buy groceries. In fact, we could not leave to go anywhere unless it was a pharmacy or, or the nearby supermarket. And so police presence was very heavy in my, in my area. And um, I think that was the most challenging part to me, adapting to our routine and, and, and trying to be you know, trying to stay on the productive path that I'm, I'm normally used to. Mm. I would like to take one of the questions from the audience. Um, we have uh, um, Malin uh, asking uh, uh, directly to Rolando, but if you, if, it, if any of the persons, uh, of the, of our guest uh, feels like they can answer that question from their experience there is uh, did you at some point uh, even now and back in the day when the things got really dramatic with the numbers and this uh, curve uh, rising uh, did you feel exposed to actually getting infected to uh, with the with the with the COVID-19 or do you think that uh, uh, there was uh, after this uh, uh, unstrategical decisions that there was like a right way to deal with the, the problem right so you know this was basically new to everyone so if I would say I did not feel exposed then I would want to you know I might be lying then because if you go out to the to the supermarket everyone has to be in gloves and you know so I actually felt kind of exposed to it but I think my method that I was using to keep sanitizing and to keep safe was pretty effective. I actually never had any symptoms as such of COVID at all. And I think that was because of my, my own precaution. And perhaps too, because of the city that, that I'm in, by the way, the cases weren't as, as you know, rampant as perhaps in Barcelona or in Madrid and those different cities. So um, yeah, I, I felt as exposed, of course but it wasn't on the level that I was going crazy, you know? Uh, 
And I would like to ask to that question now that you just to further on what you just said, do you feel that the, 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 the response from the, um, from the program that you were working with, uh, that, that took you there was a, was proper, was prompt? Did you feel protected or covered in that sense? What was your experience? Yeah, actually, I must commend them. They did an exceptional job. I was actually quite surprised in terms of how they managed to, you know, to, to keep, to ensure that all of these Erasmus students, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure it's hundreds, hundreds. And um, we managed to, they managed to ensure that everyone was okay, that finances was okay. If you needed to go home, they ensure they ensured that, you know, everything is sorted out. And I also must comment, our our university, UWE, we the international office actually reached out to all international students that were studying abroad to ensure that you know they, they kept checking in and if they could help in any way. So on both ends of you know my receiving institution and my sending institution did a fantastic job at at that. If we could slide sideways or slide to the north again. There are a couple of questions for Ariel. Ariel, did you get to improve your French while you were in France? Um, I would like to think so. Um, initially, they, what they did was, so the contract basically stipulated that really and truly we were supposed to speak with the, um, the teachers and the um, the students in English, there wasn't supposed to be any French at all. Like as since if we're if we're in the presence of um, students, so because I was with the teachers a lot around the students, we mainly spoke in English. So I had to be practicing my French on the streets. Um, the time that I managed to, I guess, get more practice was actually after the initial lockdown. Um, so. After the initial lockdown around May, they started opening the schools in stages. So actually at that point in time, I had to be speaking with the teachers a lot in French because they thought I had left, but then they realized I was still there because I couldn't leave. And so I guess they had completely disregarded like the stipulations of my contract. And so they just spoke to me entirely in French. So my days were basically me interacting with them in French and trying to improve my vocabulary as much as I could with them. So I think I did improve it as much. I still have um, an issue in terms of like confidence in terms of speaking, but I've been trying to work on that. But I think based on if I compare now, how I am now with when I just arrived, I think I will, my level, my, my speaking level has improved. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, um, did you learn any vocabulary related to COVID? Um, did I? Not really. <laughs> okay. Well, it's more, more, more along the line of um, basically what you can and cannot do, essentially. Those are, that's what I learned, like... It's an, actually, no, I did. Um, because I had to be conversing with the people um, at the stores to ask if they had this sort of product for this sort of product and whatnot in terms of combating the virus. So I had to be asking, hey, do you have um, hand sanitizer? Hey, do you have gloves? Do you have masks? Do you, or do you have like um, reusable masks? That kind of thing. Um, but in terms of like discussing the virus, no. <laughs> Okay. I think that's a question actually we'd like to take up again with the other participants, but we'll put that on pause for now. Um, the next participant that we will introduce is Mr. Russell Green. He is a teaching assistant like Ariel, but he is in the French Overseas Department of Guadeloupe. For those of you who don't know, Martinique and Guadeloupe are overseas departments of France. They're part of France. So Russell may have had some similar experiences to Ariel. We will find that out. Russell, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the program? All right. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Russell Green. And as um, Soyini said, I had a lot of similar 
issues and well situations to Ariel since Guadeloupe is a French territory. But um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I am a recent graduate of the University of the West Indies. While at UE, I studied mainly Spanish and I also pursued minors in French and linguistics. And I went on to do the teaching assistantship program in Guadeloupe. I had, chose Guad I had chosen Guadeloupe because I wanted to discover another part of the Caribbean really because I feel like we don't often tend to, you know, venture into our own region to see what it's all about, you know. So that's why I chose Guadeloupe. And I've been here since October last year. And my contract officially ended um, at the end of April. And so I'm still here um, because of the situations with travel restrictions and so on. But, um, right, so I am... Um, I came here to teach English and, of course, to, to spread the Jamaican culture as well because a part of this program is to share with French students and, of course, students in French territories um, a little bit of the cultures of English-speaking countries. So that was a part of my job as well, to be a, a sort of cultural ambassador. So what was your life like initially when you arrived? So when I arrived in Guadeloupe, I mean, everything was, for the most part, smooth sailing because, as you know, it's a Caribbean territory. So a lot of the customs were, you know, for the most part, similar and people were very warm. You know, food was very similar, so it wasn't hard to, you know, to, to adapt. Um, and I was at three different institutions. I was at two junior high schools and one vocational high school. So every day I would either take the bus or get a ride to school and, you know, start the day, teach, greet my students, so on. And I would normally be teaching between three to four days a week, um, usually between seven and 12 o'clock. It just would depend on the school in the morning, of course, and then I'd go home and, you know, relax or you know study actually because one thing I forgot to mention I'm also a student I am studying online at the university University des Antilles in Martinique so I'm pursuing a degree in the teaching of the French language and so I would kind of split my time between teaching and studying and I would say that you know the, the regular Caribbean warmth was being expressed before, prior to the virus, the virus being arriving in Guadeloupe. So everybody would um, fail la bise, as we say, which is to kiss on both sides of the cheek, you know, and that was a regular thing to do with, you know, everyone. I mean, you see somebody, that's the way you greet them. It's like shaking hands. And so that was one of the things that kind of stopped after COVID arrived in Guadeloupe. What are some of the new cultural codes you had to learn during COVID? Well, I think at the start, people would, they say, they call it a check. So you do like this to a person, you know, you'd bump fists. But I think people were a bit um, hesitant to touch hands because you know there would be germs on the hand so you don't want to have that sort of contact at all so i think what people resorted to was to bump fist bump um elbows sorry and i also would use my foot because you know <laughs> just in case somebody had sneezed into his or her elbow and you know greeting saying waving from afar and just calling out bonjour to everybody would be fine so that's what we had to do and in terms of I mean, contacting one another, we keep our distance, you know. If we had to be together, we'd have to put on a mask. We'd ensure that if there was any contact with any surface, you'd have your um, hand sanitizer handy to just get the, you know, make sure that you keep yourself protected. So those are some of the codes that kind of changed. Um. I have a question from the audience for Russell. 
what area in Guadeloupe were you located in and was it easy to find housing there? Okay, so I am along the Atlantic coast. So that's the eastern end of Guadeloupe on the island of Bastien. So it's the island where the volcano Soufriere is. And it's in a town called Capester Bellou. Um, it's a bit in between the two main um, the two main commercial and administrative towns or cities in Guadeloupe, Pointe Pit and Bastier. And in terms of finding housing, I was very fortunate to have a friend from in advance in Guadeloupe who had started the process for me from before I arrived. And she was able to find an apartment, a section of a house for me. And I mean, it was great. I know that I had some colleagues from other parts of the world, other assistants, fellow assistants, who did have difficulties finding housing. They were at Airbnbs for a few months. Others were, you know, stuck at teachers' houses. And I say stuck because it wasn't an ideal situation. So I would say that this, in terms of for somebody coming to Guadeloupe and even Martinique um, and finding, you know, housing, it can be difficult as well as it just depends on the situation. But I'd say to prepare yourself from in advance. Try your best to get in contact with somebody on the ground who you trust so you can set up housing. Um, Russell, the system that Ariel described of the attestation, having to have a certificate stating where you were going and having police checking you and so on, was it, was it exactly the same in, in Guadeloupe or was it a little bit different? It was a little bit different. I wouldn't say it was exactly the same because even, you know, in addition to what Ariel said, I would also have the news on at times and I'd see how strict it was. I'd see that there were officers posted up everywhere. You know, at every block you'd see an officer. But um, by contrast, here in Guadeloupe, in my little town, I did not see one officer. <laughs> so... Um, that was a bit different. I mean, people, I think it was mostly because here people tended to follow the rules a little bit more. I think people were very cautious about the situation. They did not want to, to you know, catch that virus at all. So uh, the, the streets were empty from day one. I mean, in the main, as I said, the main commercial areas, so the main cities like Pointe Pit, you would hear sometimes of um, persons, younger persons especially, being out after curfew and being arrested for that. But that was very rare. So in my town, the streets were empty. There was not a sound. You could hear birds squawking, frogs at night. I mean, it was completely different. What would you say was your biggest challenge and how did you cope with it? Um, my biggest challenge during the whole COVID-19 situation was, well, there were a few things. I would say, first of all, you know, having to watch to monitor my mental health, if I'm being honest, because first of all, you have the situation of isolation. I am not a very, you know, I'm not a person who is, who loves to go out very regularly. I mean, I do enjoy the occasional suave, going out with friends and so on but I'm content with my own company for the most part. But I realized that being locked up in the house, not being able to go out that much and, you know, just move around and see nature, um, that was a bit difficult. And I also, I'm a person who tends to think a lot. So I started to overthink and that led to a lot of less than positive thoughts. So I had to make sure I kind of rein myself in and one of the ways to do that was to turn off the TV, not to, to keep the news on all the time, because a constant reminder that the COVID-19 is, you know, responsible for deaths on a daily basis. And I'm talking about thousands of deaths. That's not something that is reassuring and it's not something that is going to keep your spirits high. So I decided that that was one thing I had to do. And of course, I think with everyone affected my sleep schedule, I, there were nights where I probably only slept two hours and it was a kind of insomniac situation but you know it's after a while that was resolved trying to you know not focus too much on the situation and I found that one way to really deal with this one way to 
to to really um come up with the situation and to, to find a solution was to find an outlet for self-expression. So I love to write. So I would write a lot of poems. I mean, I wouldn't want to show those poems because the feelings I was having at the, at that time, you know, wasn't very positive. So, but it was a way to let things out, and you know, people who know me very well know that I like to sing, even though I don't always emit a very pleasant song. I did something and I wrote some songs, and yeah, so those would be my personal songs to keep for me to remember during this period how I coped with the situation. We had a person in the audience that was asking if you, if you, if you, if you get a chance to 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 pick on some um, Creole from there, and they, I I would like to link that question with the with, with the thing you just said about the um, creation, you no? Know, because they, um, when, then we'll be moving to that uh, language aspects of the of the pandemics. Uh, but before we go there, I uh, I would like you to answer uh, that question for us. Did you did you pick any Creole and uh, did you take it as yours at some point? Or yes. Come on, Gilo. I can parle un petit bon Creole. So that that's for the people out there who understand Creole. So I speak a little bit of Creole. I mean, it's not perfect. There are times when I have to, you know, I know that people are cringing because it's not on point and we as Caribbean people tend to be very particular about our language so our languages so um I am I mean I learned quite a lot I think one of my main friends here who I mean I call her my friend but she was almost like a second mother while I was here she's actually Dominican but her main language as well as that of her husband is Creole so to, to, to communicate with her and her husband it was Creole There are times I've just been nodding along and saying, yeah, 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 when I didn't understand one word because they spoke so fast. But over time of being just constantly immersed, hearing Creole around you, I mean, it was, it was enchanting the language as well. It's in the music. I mean, it's the Caribbean, so Creole is ever-present. It's prevalent. It's, it's all around. It's omnipresent. So I had to learn it, and I'm glad I did. And I'm happy to say as well that at picked up a little Caribbean accent. So when people hear me, Guadeloupians hear me, they will say, wait, but you have a little Guadeloupian accent going on there for yourself. So I feel, I'm, I'm proud of that. You know, I've adapted and I'm very proud of that. Russell, um, How did you find studies, the online course that you're doing at University des Antilles? It's entirely in French, isn't it? Yes, it is. How did you find that? Well, it was, as you can imagine, it was quite difficult because, I mean, the French education system, first of all, first of all I think even at the tertiary level, it's very theoretically based. It's focused on theory. So given that the, the subject area was like education, there are a lot of theories and, you know, um, just expressions that would be used that were, you know, really hard to understand. And when you start to read academic material in French, you realize that French people tend to forget what a, a full stop is. So you'd see like, you know, lines and lines and lines of, you know, just content that you dense content that you have to understand so it was frustrating at times especially because it's an online program that is it's adaptable to your needs so which means that you are given the content the, the course material and you as a student you have to deal with everything on your own and if you have you know questions concerns you can send a lecture and email on the online portal But, I mean, it required a lot of discipline, a lot of motivation and encouragement from family and friends and fellow teachers as well, you know, who I worked with in the schools. And, I mean, it was difficult, but I'm glad I continued because it, it taught me a lot. You know, at times I may complain about it being very theoretical, not practical enough, but it did teach me a lot as it relates to educational theories and, you know, certain methods I, I could have used with my students. So it actually did translate, you know, back into the classroom while, you know, I was teaching here 
I was able to use some of the methods that I learned in the classroom. So I'm very happy with, with you know, the fact that it was, you know, the teaching aspect and the studying aspect, they did overlap. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we have on, one, um, an audience member who would like Russell to display his Guadalupian accent, please. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to be judged. <laughs> Qu'est-ce que tu veux que je dise exactement? Parce que je ne sais pas exactement comment parler. Si quelqu'un me demande de parler, c'est un peu difficile de, de montrer que j'ai un petit accent Guadeloupien, mais... C'est à toi de voir, je sais pas. Ok, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> um, um, and with that question, actually, uh, I would like to, to, to move forward, for, forward to the, the, the next person who, who was also um, working at a, uh, a French speaking entire. So, uh, Gabriel did have a, a, a similar experience or a different experience or. How was it for you, Gabriel? And good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Um, experience in terms of what exactly? In terms of uh, Martinican accent? <laughs> well, that too. Uh, but uh, can you give us like an, uh, a general view of the, the thing working there? Uh, uh, how, how, how has it been? Uh, how long have you been there? We haven't heard from you. Okay, well, first of all, I am actually a student and I am currently on my third year in Martinique. I'm a political science student and I have been in Martinique since September. And um, a typical day for me started very early because classes at University de Zonti um, begin at 7.30 and uh, they're about two hours long. And so that was, <laughs> that was something that I had to adjust to very early classes. And um, before COVID-19 really kind of came about, I remember, well, I mean, in terms of culturally, it's very similar to the rest of the Caribbean, I'd say, in terms of um, certain behaviors and attitudes. I will say though that Um, unlike the Russians' experience with Guadalupeans being very friendly, I do not find many Martinicans to be so friendly. I think they're a little bit more um, reserved, a little bit more, uh, maybe cold is too harsh, but they are not as nice. <laughs> And um, yeah, uh, I do remember also one thing that struck out about classes before COVID is I remember we had a specific course that lasted maybe about a week. And so we had to be going to that class maybe two times per day. And it was like two hours and then another two hours. And uh, that was very long. And that, that entire course was the duration of one week. So that's what it was like <laughs> before COVID. And uh, how has it been uh, since the pandemic in terms of, uh, for example, transportation uh, um, for the time you've been there, but also uh, in the places you have been to, um, have you, uh, what have been the measures? Because, because we have heard that the, 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 the government of France has just uh, spread these uh, measures to, to take care of the situation. How has it uh, affected the, uh, particularly Martinique? Well, uh, Martinique, transportation in Martinique has been difficult even before the pandemic. Um, the, the main means of transport here is by bus. If you do not have a car, taxes are fairly expensive. And so, and the buses, they, generally are supposed to be every half an hour. However, um, from time to time, they're very late. And uh, so the bus situation had been difficult from the, from the very beginning. 
during the pandemic, they were completely unavailable. So there were no buses. And, um, well, I think they've, they've started back now. But I guess it depends on where you are. Your availability, the availability of transport depends on where exactly Martinique is. Where, where in Martinique were you staying? Well, I live on campus, um, oh. campus with Shelter. Mm. And uh, yes, yes. Uh, it's like 15 minutes away from the capital, I think, of Port de France. Okay, and as a part of the academic uh, life, uh, has there been any disturbances? I mean, do you, are you are you are you taking classes right now? Uh, do you do 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 they foresee a, like a way back a, into 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 classes or or what what do you what what seems to, to be happening there? Well. Uh, before lockdown, classes were almost finished. I think we had maybe about a week and a half of school left. So when the when the advisor about um, schools being closed was implemented, we didn't have many classes left. So we didn't really do any classes online or anything like that. We just received certain assignments in order to um, receive a final grade, and then we had exams in June, in, mm -hmm. yes, well, the end of May to June. Okay, so it, it doesn't seem that you have been, uh, uh, you, you've been using the time, you've been active. Um, how do you feel right now, like in terms of uh, uh, dealing with this uh, uh, challenging aspects and then, uh, well, plus the transportation and everything, uh, you 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 feel like you're gonna stay. Um, how 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 longer do you think you're gonna be there? And uh, uh, what challenges do you think you have you, you will be facing? Well, I I shouldn't be here much longer. I wasn't supposed to be here until July, but mm -hmm. with um, challenges with flights and um, I mean there are no straight flights from Martinique to Jamaica, so we'd have to. Uh, travel to another Caribbean country and then to Jamaica and um, we have to deal with the borders being closed and reopening and things like that and um, I am hoping that I should be able to leave by the end of the month. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yes, um, that was where the challenge really was in terms of post-COVID. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, well, okay. Um, I think uh, uh, now it's uh, a good time to get, to turn, to, to let uh, the conversation gravitate a little bit more on a more communication and linguistic aspects that you, in a position of a, a, a not uh, quite belonging to the communities in which uh, the, 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 the lockdown the, got you, uh, probably perceived and uh, had to deal with. And I, I am seeing also that, that, that this is uh, conducted to the many of the questions that we have from the audience, that they, they, they are eager to know what type of uh, experience in terms of, uh, in, in terms of language, because uh, uh, this is this also suffice to say that you went there uh, and you were a uh, language te uh, teachers and learners and practitioners so i would like to add to this conversation uh, uh, the question of uh, the communicative situations the, you know because you are communicating in, in a context of a in a more difficult context, you know, in which it's a harder for you to simply open your mouth and elicit words because you're you're most of the time of the time say wearing a mask. So, what new devices or communicative situations or skills eh, 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 did you did you see eh, yourself eh, in front of eh, in this new situation? Because I am thinking eh, now. Um, 
about the, the, the question of uh, uh, the, 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 the new words, uh, new COVID related, COVID-19 related words. Uh, and I would, uh, I would like you to, to expand that uh, experience, not only to the, um, the, the, the words themselves, but also to the type of uh, new communicative experiences that you may have. Uh, and uh, I think, and I can never insist enough on this, on you as uh, persons who uh, live in country, in, in, in context uh, to which originally you do not belong. So probably you can have a, a more external uh, observation of it. So what would be your insight on that? Any, any new, ch any changes in the communication? any new codes that probably people revived or created during that time uh, that you can tell us? For example, uh, um, I was um, thinking about uh, Rolando and I don't know if you can tell us a little bit more on what, uh, those uh, uh, mannerism that the Spanish use, for example, for greeting, this double keysing, uh, what happened to that and what, uh, what happened after that? Right, so um, I think everyone knows that in Spanish culture, the double kissing and the hugging and all being touchy is very normal. And actually coming here, um, for me, that was, wasn't the most pleasant. I mean, I'm very warm and I'm very outgoing but I'm, I don't really like the touching and I'm not used to that as you know, a Caribbean person would be we greet from a little distance and we might hug you if we're really, really close. But I can recall going around here, just meeting a random um, student or a friend, an acquaintance of a friend or something like that. And a person approaches to hug and kiss and I'm like, okay. And so I need to, you know, I needed to adapt to that. But post, you know, if we can call it post COVID, people obviously cannot do that anymore. I see some people kind of do it on the side very, very quickly. But um, people are more into, you know, the elbow bumping and stuff like that. So we've had to find measures. We've had to, you know, find different ways of greeting and trying to keep the, you know, the culture alive, the Spanish culture alive here. Because um, in certain aspects, I think um, Spanish people are very warm. And at the same time, they are very... Um, disconnected they can be you know so in my apartment it coming up the apartment to people tell you hola and stuff like that hasta luego very randomly and stuff like that which i wasn't very used to and you know people that you become close with cannot hug you anymore so i could imagine what they go through here since they can't greet the way they used to and in terms of linguistics i actually think my spanish definitely improved i got to test my level and I'm, I'm at a C1 level, so I think that's pretty good. But I got to learn a lot of colloquial terms. that, And I got to learn a lot of new stuff in Spanish culture that we don't really use in our region, the Caribbean and Latin America. So a lot of new words and, um, you know, those colloquial stuff that I wasn't exposed to. You know, you have to be here to experience it firsthand, especially in a to like violin that is a bit conservative and um you know a lot of elderly are around here so you get to see like for me specifically i'm very observant so i i have that sociological aspect in my head where i you know tend to study how the older folks operate in in comparison to younger people and stuff like that Nice. While Rolando has been speaking, Renique has been smiling broadly. Renique, would you like to tell us about your experience? <laughs> anything anything uh, that you can relate to in what Rolando said? Well, um, in terms of greetings, I've had the complete opposite uh, experience. Uh, as you probably know, in Japan, people do not touch for greetings. They actually bow. They give a bow. So uh, when Corona came about, nothing much changed because people don't even shake hands here. And, um, you know, meeting someone for the first time, sometimes I'm tempted to give a hand to shake. And among the younger people, this might work. But, you know, like sometimes you would do that and the person would just be like here and, you know, you just drag back your hand shamefully. Uh, so that has been completely different for me. Uh, but in terms of the language aspect, uh, 
definitely. I've, I've been here two years in the countryside in Japan. Uh, so finding English speakers will be difficult for one. And um, my Japanese has definitely improved. Uh, it, yeah, it has definitely improved. I was supposed to be taking the equivalent of the B2 exams uh, this week, but uh, due to Corona, they got canceled. But um, in terms of uh, Russell mentioned Creole and him picking up Creole, it's also the same in Japan, where by region, the Japanese uh, language is completely different or there are various, uh, what, what's the word you use, Hogan, like dialects. Uh, so the dialect that I have learned here, I would never had heard just by studying in Jamaica. So the things that you pick up, and you know, just the usage of things. Probably you studied something in Spanish or French class, but it wasn't until you got to the country that you actually saw how it was used. Uh, yeah, being here has been very beneficial in that way, where I've seen how exactly people use the things that we were taught in class. So yeah, I think being in the country definitely gives you a, a boost to your vocabulary as well as uh, language usage. I, I, uh, Renik, I am wondering now, um, and to all of you, uh, does it, is there any type of variation to a, each of the five cases we have here? Uh, when you are wearing a mask and there's no, there, there's no saying, or for, for example, you, you know, in governments, for example, or regional authorities, they suddenly have to, to open new challenge, new um, channels and they get in touch with the, 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 the communities and the populations like in a very rapid way. So when you don't have the possibility to, 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 to make utterances uh, because you don't know the words or simply because you're wearing a mask, uh, I am, I'm thinking that perhaps there are new uh, paralinguistic codes. I don't know. Uh, is there any <laughs> memorable, thing that you can, memorable thing that you can let us know about that? But did it happen? Um, so in terms of uh, linguistics, uh, Japan has what they call gairaigo, which is uh, loan words from foreign languages. So uh, in terms of picking up new COVID vocabulary, it wouldn't be very difficult for an English speaker because Japan just takes the words from English. So you'd say social distancing or you know, coronavirus, which is, you know, coronavirus or, uh, yeah, so they take these terms, uh, saying so you, you wouldn't have too many new words to add to your vocabulary if you didn't already know them as a native English speaker. Uh, and in terms of the codes, uh, many classrooms have come up with uh, interesting ways to carry out activities. So uh, in, instead of speaking in class, for example, uh, you would have to use different body parts to express what you wanted to say. Uh, you know, so instead of saying you're hungry, of course you just do the gesture, or if you're playing some sort of classroom activity, then you know, your head or your arms or your legs would represent uh, some different uh, sort of vocabulary. So yeah, in, in, in the classroom, I've seen how you know, these codes that you just mentioned uh, can come into play. But in terms of actual society, I think everything just goes as normal uh, in terms of wearing masks and you know, observing social distancing. We have a question here for Ariel. Ariel, could you remind us where you were in France and tell us, was it difficult to drum up a social life outside of your relationship with other teachers at your school? Okay, so I was in um, Bordeaux, actually the actual city. So I was in the city center or at least near to the city center. Um, in terms of social life, so my so at the school the teachers the the age group was actually between um i would say around like 40 to like the 60s so we had a lot of older teachers so we would talk um essentially during lunch that was the time when we would like discuss certain things talk about life talk about something funny that kind of stuff but in terms of like outside of um, 
outside of the school. Um, initially, I only had interactions with fellow um, assistant teachers. And so at one point, I decided to go ahead and um, join this, um, I don't remember what it's called, but it was this group where basically on specific days, we meet up at specific areas or specific places and we would practice speaking whichever language you wanted to speak. So it was basically like a language exchange program. And so through that, I was able to um, meet other people, um, hang out with them at different places, that kind of thing. Um, it was actually um, not until around the lockdown or like when, um, um, like shortly after the lockdown, um, or like the measures were a bit less strict in terms of like people being able to move on a bit more freely. Um, it wasn't until then that um, I was able to, I guess, bond a bit more with some of the, um, the, the people at school. So my, initially I would hang around with fellow assistant teachers and um, people I'd met at the language exchange because in order to meet people in France, it's not like you can just meet somebody and, and it's, and it's not easy because I've noticed that the French, they tend to be like really reserved. So it's when they are around like, um, people they're most familiar with, that's when they're the most lively. If they don't know you, they're not going to talk to you. So it's like, if you want to meet French people, you have to go out, put yourself out and like say, meet them at like, say, um, bars or, um, as I said, language programs, language exchange events, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ariel. You're welcome. We have a question or a couple of questions for Gabrielle. Um, Gabrielle, you are in an international relations bachelor's to master's degree program, right? How yes. did you... Could you tell us more about your experience in the international relations program? How did you like it and what did you learn about yourself? Well, um, I, was, I was in France last year and that was my first year um, living in a foreign country. And it was quite a, like it was quite a roller coaster. Um, the program itself is very demanding. It's very hard. And um, before starting this, the program, I had no, I had no um, experience with the French, with the French educational system, and how different it was from our system. It's extremely different, and even with the methodology, it went in terms of writing um, papers, dissertations, things like that, and even in terms of um, class presentations, it it is extremely different and that was something that took some getting used to and um what i learned about myself i am more adaptable than i thought i guess <laughs> it wasn't as hard as i thought it would be to um to to understand and uh, to understand and um really like indulge I guess in um, the cultures of the different countries because uh, Martinique the culture in Martinique is a little similar it's a little different than in France um, it's a Caribbean island and of course there are some similarities to the rest of the Caribbean and it also has a little touch of I guess France in a way so um, yes that was that was interesting to experience and uh, what else did I learn about myself? <laughs> um, I guess that I'm resilient. <laughs> uh, yes, I guess that I'm resilient because, I mean, in terms of the pandemic and things like that, it's not really something that any of us have ever had to face before. And um, new challenges that came up and stuff, the way that we were able to adapt and um, deal with it. I think show some resilience. Would you sign if you had it to do all over again? Would you sign up for it again? <laughs> 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 uh, 
to be completely honest, I do not think so. <laughs> <laughs> Because of COVID or because of the program? Uh, perhaps a little both. The program on its own is very challenging. And uh, to add these extra, these extra new experiences that have never been seen before, um, kind, of, kind of like, I guess, brings it to a new level. <laughs> <laughs> and what has campus life been like since the, pan the pandemic? Well, where I live, it's a student hall, basically. And um, where I am, there are also other Caribbean students here from um, Dominica, St. Lucia. Uh, there's also Haiti. I think there are also um, Moroccans. There's also an Italian girl. Um, so there are actually quite a few people from different countries. And um, well, in during confinement, we actually had a, a little party because one of our, one of um, a fellow Jamaican, it was her birthday and of course we couldn't go anywhere. And it seemed as if it was a good idea to celebrate here. I mean, we, we are just here and uh, we don't really have like any um i guess you'd say like anybody that would like come to really check very often and so we can do whatever we want on the campus and stuff with the exception of i guess making too much noise because then that attracts the security but aside from that we're free to do whatever we want on, on campus Okay. Would you say that it has been worth it? <laughs> um, which part exactly? Um, you're you're part pursuing the program, right? Me pursuing the program. <laughs> um, this is that's a difficult answer. I've had good very good and very bad experiences with this program and so i'm not really sure i can completely say that it's really worth it but i guess it depends on how much you like what you're doing and um yes how, how much you like it and how interested you are and uh, I think that's important because if it's not something that you really like, if it's not something that you're very interested in, it's easy to become demotivated. It's easy to want to give up because it's very, it's very demanding, it's very stressful. Um, the system is very different from what you're used to. And I think if you don't, if, if it's not something that you're very, very interested in, it's very easy to want to quit. So I think that's important that you have to be very interested and it has to be something that you really like and want to continue. That being said, I've had a lot of good experiences and um, sometimes, I'd say sometimes I think it's worthwhile, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, we understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I I would like start to put things together in a in a in a, um, in a more general sense. Um, I would like to have a participation from you all, uh, trying to reach because I mean, we know the situation has been devastated in some countries, has been really difficult everywhere, has been challenging for governments, for persons eh, 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 traveling and staying home, eh, the economy, eh, we know it's been real hard. Eh, eh, and eh, probably all your experiences eh, grew eh, eh, more difficult because of the current situation. But I, I would like to to to, to have you 
highlighting on the, you know other parts of the experiences, particularly in in, in what it touches to, for example. A mental health, a what things you did to, you know, to keep yourself afloat because it's been difficult and not only in your experience but in many persons, locals and travelers, uh, visitors and students and academics but regular people as well. So on that one, on mental health, uh, but also uh, on, the, on the good things, is, is, are there any good takeaways of you uh, having this experience particularly in these times of coronavirus they, that you can say like, okay, this was a, de a terrible situation, but I learned this and I would add this to my particular set of experiences that I cherish. Uh, so on that, uh, on US travelers, no? So mental health, uh, US travelers. Um, on the things that probably uh, went uh, overshadowed by, by by this whole situation, for example, in the case of uh, uh, um, Russell and Gabrielle, no, we did we miss the carnival? Did we miss any 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 good thing in Spain? I I I, I I'm aware that there's many things that we don't know that we, that we didn't get to 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 benefit that that you didn't get to benefit. So in that in that in that, in that too, and um, what are your expectations? Either if you are staying there, as in the case of uh, Renique, or if you are coming back, as in the case of Rolando and the uh, Ariel, who's already back. Uh, what are your uh, hopes and fears toward uh, the new normal? Is there such a thing? Uh, what do you think? What insight would you leave us with? So just to wrap up, I mentioned many things at a time. So I would say, like, in terms of mental health, do you have anything to share? In terms of uh, the things that we went overshadow in your local uh, context, and in, in terms of the of the new normal, is there is there such a thing? Is there going to happen? What do you what, what do you have to tell? Well, as it relates to um, mental health, I think I did mention that already. Um, I'll just give a quick summary, which is basically at this point in time, it's not good to be too informed. So it's, it's good to pace yourself as it relates to your media cons consumption. Um, trust me, it's not good to, to always have the TV on, the radio on, looking at what's happening all over the world. And as we know, coronavirus isn't the only issue around the world right now. So there are other very serious issues that can be very depressing. So just have to provide a filter for ourselves. I mean, I'm speaking personally. I, everybody has their own means of dealing with things. And as I said earlier, um, find a means of expression, a means of creativity so that you can let go of the negativity inside you. So that would be something that I'd recommend, whether it be through you know, writing, drawing, painting, singing. Some people meditate, you know, do yoga, exercise, you know, whatever it, it may be. And as it relates to some of the events that um, were, I guess, postponed or canceled because of COVID, uh, carnival happened right before. <laughs> right before um, the, the virus hit Guadeloupe, actually. So I was able to witness the parades in the street. Very beautiful and um, very noisy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there was that, but there were other festivals, I think, that I, uh, locally celebrated festivals that you wouldn't hear about, you know, in Jamaica that's more related to, like, Catholicism because Guadeloupe is a very Catholic island. So there are a lot of Catholic holidays and celebrations that are also intertwined with the culture. And there was another um, festival having to do with crabs. I think it's when it's crab season. Uh, um, and March, April, where you had crab season in Guadeloupe. And usually around that, they have, you know, festivals, little parties everywhere in their respective homes, probably even bigger events. I know there's a bigger event on one of the small islands in the Guadalupe and um, and been written on a wide scale. Um, that didn't really happen as long as on the news we saw 
um, we saw persons um, going about with their, you know, containers with their crabs and so on, selling crabs to different families. And, you know, we saw some families observing that part of the festival, you know, individually within the family, observing, you know, the regulations they need to observe. And it was encouraging because, you know, it shows that despite the situation, people were able to keep up, you know, the practice of their culture. So that was encouraging. So that's my piece. Uh, we'd like to hear from all of you. Um, would you, how would you say you have appreciate, have you appreciated the experience of being abroad? Yeah. Um, if I can go ahead for me, I can definitely say yes, because, um, you know, I've learned so, so many things being about five months here. Like I said, tonight is actually my last, my last night before I leave to go home. And although, it has been a crazy thing trying to get back home. Now I have to um, take a flight to Mexico City and then try to make, to make it to the border down to, to Belize. But besides all, everything that I you know that we endured, I definitely um, say, think that I had an amazing time despite I could only imagine how much better it could have been if COVID wasn't a thing and perhaps how broke I would have been too, you know, trying to going all over the place. And, mm -hmm. But um, mental health and everything for me, I take it very seriously. So I remember I had times where I would just block off school for a day or two, not, not do anything school related and just invest some time, in, you know, trying to cope and, you know, cut out the media for a bit and stuff like that. And in the past two weeks, I've been to a nearby Spanish cities, um, to have been to Segovia and I totally enjoyed it there. You know, everyone is taking precaution, but at the same time trying to, you see a little visitors and tourists here and there, trying to, you know, enjoy things amidst COVID. And so I went north as well in the Basque country, close to France. And, to, you know, I got to see some beach and everything. I actually felt that like I was in the Caribbean and that was quite refreshing to get some fresh air and, you know, get some sun and everything coming coming out of winter straight you know having to endure quarantine in the winter and then coming straight into spring and the summer just needed that breath of fresh air and it was very um very nice so my experience in summer was was good i would do it all over again except you know covid being that that tight and strict yeah if i if I may just add to uh, what has been said, uh, I appreciate the experience here, definitely. Uh, when I was studying abroad, it was completely different. I was in uh, Canada, which is a culture that's closer to mine. And um, it was you know, very easy in terms of language. There was no need to think about uh, many different social customs that existed. But being here in Japan, um, as uh, Gabriel mentioned, uh, resilience is a thing. Uh, the experience is quite two-sided. Uh, you are away from your family, your friends, uh, your own language, everything that is uh, not unique, uh, everything that is uh, known to you, everything that you have grown up with. And so moving outside of that and being forced to uh, living a society where you stand out even when you don't want to is uh, very difficult. And uh, as Gabriel mentioned, if you're not really motivated about doing such programs, then it might be easy to you know pack your bags and go home. Uh, because many times being here, I've thought you know I, sh I should just go back to Jamaica. But I'm glad I have stayed. I am almost at the end of my. Uh, two-year contract and um, I feel that after being here that there is nothing that I can't do um, I feel if I have survived, live, survived living in Japan uh, alone for such a long time then there is no challenge that could be placed in front of me that I would uh, back down from so that's one thing that uh, living abroad does for you it gives you a perspective and of course the traveling I've had the experience of traveling uh, Southeast Asia uh, and uh, Central Asia as well. I've been to Korea, I've been to Qatar, 
I've been to Turkey, I've been to, uh, since being in Japan. So it's been a wonderful experience uh, being able to travel. And um, just the last question that Senor Alvarado mentioned, in terms of the things that are being overshadowed by COVID, there are lots of festivals that have been cancelled. But uh, we have to remember as well that there are many other issues that people are facing, as Rosso mentioned. So, you know, you saw the, uh, what was it? Not the drought, but the plague that was in Kenya. Uh, and, you know, other countries that were suffering from things while the world was, you know, focusing on COVID. So we have to remember that, uh, you know, politics plays a big role in the issues that get focused on and many people are suffering things that we aren't experiencing. So, yeah. Thank you, Renique. Um, this question is for all of you, of course. Um, would you say that your experience has made you, you more tolerant of yourself and of others? Uh, Should I answer again? I see okay. everyone thinking hard about this question. <laughs> Can I... Well, I would say I think that it has made me more tolerant because, I mean, in terms of experiences and people, not everybody is going to be some, um, like their behaviors, their attitudes, nor cultural things. It's not going to be the same or even similar to what you know. And uh, I think it's important to be tolerant of other people, other things and stuff like that. And I... I think yes, I have because I've I've been able to become more open minded, which is something that I um, experienced through tra traveling and living in other countries. And so yes, I think tolerance has, my tolerance has increased. Um, uh, to touch on the other questions from before, just very quickly. Uh, yes, I do appreciate the experiences that I have lived so far because I try to. Um, I try to appreciate all the experiences, you know, good and bad. Some are a bit more difficult than others. Um, in terms of mental health, well, there were, as Renik had mentioned, there, are, there were a lot of things happening while COVID was happening. And in my case, in our case here in Martinique, we were also having a drought. And so while I was here on campus, uh, we had water issues. And so... Um, I think the water left for four consecutive days and that was pretty difficult to deal with on its own and especially in the midst of a pandemic you can imagine that was quite a lot and so I think in terms of mental health it is important I think as Russell mentioned to sometimes disconnect because um, information overload is a thing um, taking in too much negativity at once is not good for anyone and so yes i do think it's important to disconnect and unwind sometimes in order to keep your sanity to you know the stability that you need and things like that i think that's an important thing to do um it just to add on to what gabriel was saying um and what everybody else was saying um, my being in France puts a lot of things per in perspective and um, there are some things that I took for granted. So, for example, when I was in France, like let's talk about, say, the whole banking system. So when you first arrive in France, everything is connected to your bank, but then also you have to have like um, an address. So if you don't have an address, you cannot open up a bank account. So you have to have an address first and then have a have a bank account or it, it's really convoluted because um, the French system is is very complicated um, but the whole matter of like going around like say the banking system I realized that the banking system in Jamaica is a bit better in the sense that um, in terms of like opening up your accounts and um, having access to your accounts like using a card and whatnot so like when I first arrived um, in order to get a, a SIM card, you have to have an account. If you don't have a bank account, you cannot have a SIM card. Um, so I went to the um, to the phone company. I was like, "Hey, can I have a SIM card?" They're like, "Do you have a 
a credit card or a debit card? And I was like, um, no, no, I don't. And they said, well, you can't get your SIM cards. I was like, but I have the cash. And they're like, no, you have to have an account because through that account, they will see your address and everything. So they'll know basically if anything happens, they have your information. And um, so basically it was two weeks of my going around with no data, nothing, um, unable to, like, I couldn't, I had to be um, using also cash because I didn't have a card or anything because it takes like two weeks to get a card. And um, so like in Jamaica, you go in, you set up an appointment, you go in, you open the account, you get the card, same time, there's that. But in France, it's completely different. You have a long waiting process. And it's like, for everything, actually, anything administrative, administration related, you have, um, you have to have patience um, when getting things sorted out. So I thought paperwork was slow in Jamaica. In France, it's, it's, way, it's, it's way more, it's, it's slow. It's much slower. So you have, to, when, when in France, you have to learn to like, be a bit more like, tolerant a bit more patient of everything because their system's really different from like the Jamaican system and um despite that I actually would want to to um to go back again because what I enjoyed about my time there was um being able to travel freely or the transportation the transportation system like I really liked so like if you wanted to go anywhere, you were able to like take the bus, you were able to take the tram or the train, and um, it was like cheap to take. It was cheap to take the the bus, the the the, the tram, the train. It was that's what I appreciated the cheapness of transportation to go wherever you wanted to go in France. Um, in terms of the pandemic, um, really, as what everybody has been saying, try to the best way to to like not lose yourself is to um i guess cut yourself off from media because too much of that it's gonna put you in a serious funk and it's it's and speaking from experience it's hard to come out of that um after you've put yourself in that situation so um i think i've lost my train of thought um so i do think i benefited from my experience i actually i mean even if this were to happen again, I probably would still continue because it's still something it's, 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 I'd see it as like a form of like character building. It's something to build you up, something to improve yourself kind of thing. Um, but also to make sure to take care of yourself as well. That's also important as well. So, yeah. Okay. We'd like to say thank you very much to our participants. Um, and also, uh, mm -hmm. we would like uh, um, to think of, uh, to, to have you think about uh, what is that uh, that you would say um, to, to you or so, I mean, to you in the past or someone like you uh, in the present uh, time uh, that is preparing or wishing uh, uh, to go uh, to embark on one of those uh, pro in all these uh, programs? Uh, would you have any encouraging or caution word to them? Would you like to, to would you do anything different? Uh, would you refrain from doing anything? Uh, what would you say to, 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 to your past self uh, in terms of, uh, hey, remember to pack some sunscreen or I don't know, you know, some, any, any advice that you can actually use, uh, um, you know, like not only to face the pandemic because nobody certainly does know what to do with this, but um, what would have been better uh, and this would also can apply even to the programs. If you have any uh, positive uh, uh, feedback for those uh, programs or for the places you are at, I, don't, I, I would like to let the, the, the floor open in that sense for, for, for all of you, please.
Well, I guess for me, I could say in terms of teaching, uh, not to take myself too seriously because I would get really upset when I'd have um, difficulties with the students. Sometimes, I mean, I would say six times out of 10 or even seven, the students would really make the job difficult. Um, and these are students between the ages of 11 and 21. So from all stages of adolescence, you know, there are all different sorts of things going on in their head and they have other issues as well. So, you know, they had their, they were really difficult at times. And I had to, I think there was one point when I just, there was one class where the students would not listen. They would, they just did not care. They were having their own class. Uh, no, let us say that I have flashbacks of myself as a student. They were having their own class, you know, not paying attention. And every time you said, can you quiet down, please? They'd be quiet for like five seconds. And then literally, as you started speaking, everybody would go back to what they were doing, even with the teacher in the room. So, I mean, there were times when I went home really upset, like really, really, really upset and reconsidering whether I even wanted to become an, a teacher, an educator, whatever. And I just had to kind of put myself into focus, thanks to encouragement from family members and friends and, of course, fellow teachers, teachers with whom I worked, you know, who said, you know, there were some of them who were at the point of, on the verge of retirement. So they had been in it for over 30 years. So they were really encouraging and they gave me a lot of good advice. And so that was another thing. And then the last thing I'll say is that I was a bit timid. As I said, I'm very much a homebody. So I did not, I, I did leave and I did go out and I did visit a lot of places, but not as much as I could have because of, you know, being afraid of maybe getting lost or, you know, just being in an unfamiliar situation. And I think that when you travel or when you're in a different country, you have to sometimes let go of those inhibition, inhibitions so as to really enjoy your experience. So I did enjoy my experience, but I could have enjoyed it more if I kind of let go and allowed myself to be unsure in certain situations and just live in the moment, per se. I don't like these cliche expressions, but yes. So that was my experience. Yeah, well, for me, I would, I would actually, um, you know, advise any any student that might be tuned in, especially in the department. You know, if you want to come to on the Erasmus program, just go for it. Um, it's, I mean, I don't think they're they're taking anybody this semester, but the following semester, just go for it. It's it's worth it, and you might actually get to do way way more than I got to do. So, um, there's so much to see, so much to do, and a lot of people to meet. So it all depends on what you want to do. I definitely had a good time here, despite everything. So I, I think that it's a very, very good program that um, we should definitely have a lot of students looking into it moving forward. Thank you, Rolando. So we would um, like to, uh, oh yes, go ahead, Renique. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say for the first year, uh, Rolando just said, uh, just go for it, just apply. Uh, you know, you might have the experience of a lifetime uh, being outside of your own country and outside of your own culture. And for anyone who is thinking of coming to Asia, especially, as uh, Senor Alvarado said, make sure you bring some Caribbean spices and stuff. Uh, you won't be able to find your curry powder or your all purpose seasoning or your drink seasoning anywhere. So just ensure that you bring them and even the things that you would take for um, advantage back home, uh, like your deodorant and stuff like that. I thought Japan would be this great international space where I could get anything. And um, it was very different. Um, so doing a bit of research helps, but don't do too much research because you want to be able to just explore and learn about the place you're living while there. So yeah, do that and um, yeah, you'll have a great experience. Okay, uh, thank also, you, Renique. Yes, Aria? Also, just to add to, to what Renique was saying, also pack light, do not overpack, um, <laughs> because while you're there, you're going to want to do some shopping. So speaking yeah. from experience, um, pack the, 
bare necessities so like what you think you will need but don't pack too much clothing because you're going to want to do some shopping so <laughs> ensure that you come not too light but you know not too heavy as well so ensure that you have enough space for whatever you um for whatever extra shopping you want to do so that you're able, be able to bring back what you want back home so yeah Okay. Currently trying to figure out if I need another suitcase. A couple of hours before the flight. <laughs> that was that was my situation. You're leaving tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If anything, I can run out early in the morning to get one. That's that's the, I'm I, I'm at that point right now. <laughs> so yeah, Rolando of the past. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we will let Rolando go pack <laughs> and figure <laughs> yes, out what yes. he's going to do with his stuff. Um, we just want to say a big thank you to all of our participants. It has been a very rich and engaging session with all of you. You have all made a valuable contribution to this discussion. And we wish you all the very best with the continuation of your studies or your careers as you move forward. Mm. And... Um, we just want to encourage those in the audience who are interested in going, studying abroad or teaching abroad too. As Rolando and, and Renik said, go for it. <laughs> okay. Yeah.